So now the final idea that we're going to be speaking about in this lecture on respiration is the idea of gas exchange specifically. So we've mentioned the idea that gas exchange happens, O2 comes into the body, CO2 leaves the body, but now we're going to look at the details necessary to understand what promotes that type of gas exchange in order to really ensure successful respiration. So what we need to remember is that there's this coordination that's necessary in gas exchange, meaning that the coordination between the circulation and between gas exchange needs to be very, very much in line. So there needs to be a coordination between the circulation that's occurring throughout the body, the blood that's traveling throughout the body, and also the gas exchange that's happening specifically at the respiratory structures that we've highlighted. So you need both of those things to be working in concert together. Now, the way that they work together is, again, based off of the laws of partial pressure, specifically the partial pressures of oxygen and the partial pressures of carbon dioxide, both of which are gases, are going to vary as the gases move between different parts of, as gases move, let me finish that sentence, between the different parts of the body, specifically Gases will move from the air, and they will go into the blood, and then they will go into the tissues. All of these separate areas at which the gases need to get to or get out of, they're going to have different partial pressures. And the arrangement at which these different gases leave or enter any of these places is going to definitely be highlighted when we talk about the different exchange that happens throughout this respiratory process. So let's take a look. So what we have is the following. Initially we have to start the process and in order to start the process we have to look at what happens during inhalation. Inhalation is bringing air in from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure from the outside of the body to the inside of the body. So during inhalation what we are going to see is this mixing of fresh air, air that's completely from the outside of the body, plus air that's already in the lungs and they're both going to mix okay so we get this initial mixing air and lungs both are going to mix okay so that's what happens during inhalation to start this process this then creates a gas mixture right we have a gas mixture with different gases and that gas mixture is going to be in the alveoli that gas mixture will represent sort of a potential for partial pressures for specific gases within that gas mixture. Like let's say a gas of interest could be oxygen or a gas of interest could be carbon dioxide. All of this is going to be presented in a mixture that's found in this functional unit really of the lungs known as the alveoli. Now, the number one thing that's going to sort of stipulate what goes on and what's leaving, what's exchanging is partial pressure, right? And that's going to be defined by this general relationship that's pretty much uh, seen throughout respiration. You're going to notice that there's an increased partial pressure of oxygen and also a decreased partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Now you have to remember, it's all relative to two points. And the two points of comparison right now are going to be of air. So air is going to have lots of oxygen, not as much of the CO2 as compared to the blood. So it's air versus blood. Blood contains more CO2, therefore air is going to have less CO2 partial pressure compared to blood. And contrastingly, air contains this, P, this partial pressure of oxygen, high amount, and blood will not have as much of oxygen within it. This is what's basically driving the pushing of oxygen into the body and the pushing of carbon dioxide outside of the body because the blood possesses carbon dioxide and the air possesses a partial pressure of oxygen that's high, allowing for a high to low scenario and switch, a high to low gas exchange scenario to occur between the air and the blood, and that's going to be happening at the alveolar capillaries, because that's where lots and lots of exchange is going to occur successfully. 
So what do we get? What's the result of this? The result of this is going to be a net diffusion event. It's always about high to low in respiration. The high to low arrangement overall results in oxygen moving into the blood at the alveolar capillaries and also involves CO2 moving out of the blood and into the alveoli. The reason why it's moving into the alveoli is because that CO2 has to be exhaled out. So we get this switcheroo between the amount of oxygen that was in the air and the amount of CO2 that was in the blood, they basically are going to switch spaces in this net diffusion event happening at the lungs. And therefore, we're then going to see the fact that after this net diffusion and exchange occurs, the blood itself leaves the lungs via what are known as pulmonary veins. And we know that veins are not necessarily oxygenated or deoxygenated. They just mean that these are going to be blood vessels going towards the heart. If these are blood vessels coming from the lungs, <clears throat> they're coming from the lungs going towards the heart, at which where we had this exchange, we very much know that the blood going towards the lungs right now is oxygenated because of the oxygen that entered the blood at this net diffusion event at the alveolar capillaries. This then is going to result and promote a systemic circulation of blood, a systemic circulation of oxygenated blood more specifically. So what do we see? Once it goes back to the heart, it's going to be pumped out of the heart to the rest of the body, and that's called systemic circulation. This is oxygenated blood. So now, in the systems, O2 will go out of the blood. It's originally there, but then it's going to go out of the blood because it needs to go to areas that need it. It goes out of the blood and into tissues. And also, simultaneously during circulation, you'll also notice that CO2 will be entering the blood. It will come into the blood. And where does it come from? It comes from the tissue. So notice how I'm going to draw this arrow right here from the tissue to the, to the blood is where we have the arrangement of CO2. This is another gas exchange event that occurs just opposite of what happened within the lungs and the alveolar capillaries. This is because now this is no longer, this is basically the pulmonary circuit shown here. This is now the systemic circuit. Notice the coordination necessary between circulation and gas exchange. It's very, very evident that they have to talk to each other. Eventually what's going to happen is um, once this exchange occurs successfully, Successfully, the tissues that need blood get blood. The tissues that want to get rid of carbon dioxide get rid of carbon dioxide. Overall, the blood is then going to return to the heart, and we just start this process all over again. The blood returns to the heart. It's in a deoxygenated form in this state, and then it gets reoxygenated. So we'll write gets reoxygenated, reoxy for short, in the lungs, and this process starts all over again. Be sure to look at figure 42.29 to get a really good visual understanding of the direct connection between circulation and gas exchange that relies on the partial pressure laws that we talked about, relies on diffusion, and simultaneously shows you the different pulmonary and systemic circuits that result as a part of the breathing and overall need for oxygen throughout the body. In addition to this coordination that's necessary for successful gas exchange, what's also necessary at more of a cellular level are things known as respiratory pigments. So this is a big idea. This is looking at it at a much, much more micro scale. This is a very macro view of what's going on. If we go at a much more cellular view, the things that are really helping gas exchange push forward are respiratory pigments. These are structures that are going to circulate, there's that circulation showing up again, within the blood or even within the hemolymph. So it's even found in hemolymph. So that's going to be where it's found. It's contained within specialized cells. So cells themselves will have these respiratory pigments as a part of their differentiation and development. They will have respiratory pigments within them. That's why they're very specialized cells that have respiratory pigments. They are going to be important because they increase 
the cell's ability, so they increase a cell's ability uh, of, of fluid to transport O2. Increased ability of whatever fluid we're talking about, let's say it's blood, right? Uh, the fluid that transports stuff in us is blood. Um, that fluid has an increased ability to transport oxygen if and only if it has respiratory pigments within it. And our blood certainly has that. And another stipulation of a respiratory pigment is that it must also have basically a metal uh, element bound to a protein structure. So this may look a bit foreign right now, but when we put this in the context of what we have as humans, a good example of a respiratory pigment, something you've definitely heard of before, is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, or more commonly abbreviated as HB, is going to be found in most vertebrates. All of us, all humans have hemoglobin floating within their blood, floating within specialized cells called red blood cells, right? So they're within our RBCs. They're going to increase the ability of fluid to transport O2. What's the fluid that hemoglobin is found within? If they're red blood cells, the fluid is blood. Blood has a difficult time transporting O2 on its own. What is going to be utilized is hemoglobin because hemoglobin is a four polypeptide chain protein in which each specific polypeptide chain of this four polypeptide chain structure, each chain is going to have with it a heme group. A heme group, otherwise known as an iron atom, there's the metal that's bound to the protein for polypeptide chains. This heme group, H-E-M-E, -E, is going to be an iron atom that allows for successful combination with oxygen. Because what happens is, each of the iron atoms on a hemoglobin molecule, there are going to be four polypeptide chains, thus four heme groups, thus four iron atoms, each iron atom is going to have this capability of binding very, very nicely to one O2 molecule to ensure proper movement and transport of that O2 molecule to a place that needs it. But now what we'll conclude this lecture on is looking at not just the fact that hemoglobin contains oxygen, but the fact that hemoglobin has to distribute and drop off oxygen at the right place. How does it know how to do this? That will be what we'll talk about and conclude this lecture on in the next video.